to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Luke Cobray. Praise God, praise God. I'll tell you what, why don't we do this? I'm going to go before the Lord in prayer. I'm going to get down on my knees, but would you join me as we honor the Lord? Why don't you go ahead and stand as we go before the Lord in prayer today? Father God, we come before you today, Lord, and we are just grateful for the opportunity to come into the house of the Lord. Your word says that I was grateful. I was glad when they said, let us go into the house of the Lord. Father, we thank you that we come into this place not to hear from a man, not to hear from a woman or from a band, but God, we come into this place to hear from you. Father, we fully acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the senior pastor of this church, and we just ask that you would open our eyes to see and our ears to hear the word that you have caused us to hear today. Father, we thank you that we could leave this place impacted and empowered to go and do the work of your ministry all across the world. Father, we thank you that you would set your presence upon this house, but Lord, we also wouldn't ask that you just put your presence upon us, but Father, all around those churches also, and those churches in the Inland Empire and all throughout the world, Father, we thank you for our co-laborers in Christ, Father, uh, Emmanuel Baptist, Ecclesia Christian Center, Inland Christian Fellowship, the Way World Outreach, Father, we thank you for the Water of Life, Harvest Christian Fellowship, the Grove, Father, all the churches in the Inland Empire and all across the world, Father, we ask that you would speak to them and deliver your presence to them as well, Father, we thank you that we are no better than anybody else, but rather co-laborers in the body of Christ. And we give you the praise and the glory and the honor in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Well, if you've got your Bibles with you, why don't you go ahead and turn to the book of Hebrews. As we continue in on Hebrews, the third chapter here, you know, we go line upon line, precept upon precept. We've been into the book of Hebrews now for some time and probably for the next decade. Now, I'm not sure how long, but we will be in Hebrews for quite some time. And we've been picking up in Hebrews. Now we're in the third chapter. If you guys were here, you recall Pastor Jim in the past two weeks had brought a wonderful, amazing message, touched my life in many ways, called In the Day of Temptation, talking about the day of trial. Before that was another amazing series by Pastor Jim and also Pastor Dan, talking about the hardening of our hearts and what things harden our hearts. And man, I tell you what, just opened up so many doors and opened up so many things to me in my own life that just touched me. And so I know that God is just doing a great and mighty work out of the book of Hebrews. And I'm encouraged today that we're going to continue reading on in the third chapter. And I firmly believe wholeheartedly that God has got something great and mighty for you today. So if you've got your Bibles, as we join into together into the word of God, we're going to pick up in Hebrews, the third chapter. And I have got to find my notes for there they are. Hebrews, the third chapter, as we pick up verse number eight. Here we're reading In the eighth chapter, or I'm sorry, the third chapter, verse number eight, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. In the day of trial in the wilderness. Now you remember we talked about things that hardened our hearts. We talked about in the day of temptation. Now we're going to continue on to move to the new subject, a subject that has been close to my heart, as I myself have been experiencing this, is in the day of wilderness, is in the wilderness. The title of today's message, if I I was to give it a title, I would call it In the Wilderness, Into the Wilderness. And you know, today I want to talk to you about stepping into the wilderness. And you know, right there, that's a, that's a reference to, to the Old Testament, to the children of Israel as they wandered from Egypt into the wilderness to go to the, inhabit the promised land. And you know, talked about how they hardened their hearts in, in rebellion against God. And now we're looking back and we're talking about in the day of wilderness and into the wilderness. And I want to talk to you a little bit about wilderness. You know, when we think of wilderness, you think of desert places, places that are uninhabitable, places that that mankind or people do not live, do not exist. You know, you might think of uh, into the wilderness as you might be driving on that blessed 15 freeway out to, you know, towards the desert, towards Las Vegas. Once you hit a certain civilization, it ceases to exist. All of a sudden now it's just desert. And as the children of Israel and as various people throughout their lives in the Bible wandered through the wilderness, how many of you guys know that life is as it is? And in our lives, we have good moments and we have good times and we have down moments and and bad times. And we experience in our own lives times of wilderness, times of desert place, perhaps where it's we may not be hearing from God as we once did. Perhaps it's our finances may not be doing what they once were. You know, our relationships with our family, our friends, our loved ones, whoever it might be, might be suffering from what they once were. Life is as it is, and we have good times, and we have bad times. And I remember I was sharing with some people about relationships, and I was saying, you know, in, in any relationship that you see that is perfect, that has never had any low moments, that has never had any bad times, that has always been perfect, never been conflict, never been anything from day one till the end, I said, you know, the bottom line is, is that's not a real relationship. Why? Because we are human. Yeah. 
And then even in our relationship with God, God himself towards us is perfect, but we, in reciprocation to God, are not. And even in our relationships to God, wit is not always perfect. Why? Because on our end, we have our highs and we have our lows. And you know, the beautiful thing is, is I recall back to my marriage with my wonderful wife, Stacy. And in some of those low moments that we've had, some of those arguments, some of those fights, some of those, those, um, you know, with those times where we have butted heads and just couldn't agree on something, sometimes you look back and those are the times that we strengthened our relationship. We solidified something. Because, you know, the bottom line is that it is easy to say life is good when life is good. But not so much when we go through those wilderness and those times of our desert places. So today what we're going to do is we're going to talk about those wilderness times in our life. You know, I like to think of life as, you know, the example, maybe the visual illustration of life is the example of a chain. And each event, each moment of our life, each, each certain course that we go through in our life is a link into that chain. And you've all heard that term, that phrase, that a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. And sometimes we have those good moments in our lives where those links of our life are strong. And we have those great times when the sun seems to shine down upon us, but then also we have those moments in our life where our links of our chain may not be as strong. Maybe we may be going through desert times or wilderness. And then, you know, what it is so easy for us to do is to take focus upon those strong links in the chain and to forget those weak links. But when we forget and when we, when we neglect those weak links in our chain, that chain is only as strong as its weakest link. And when the trials, when the temptations, when the pressures, when the stresses of life come and they put stress upon that chain, when they put a load upon that chain, that chain is only as strong as its weakest link. And today, through the Word of God, we're going to take a look at some examples of those who have gone through the wilderness in their lives. It was the physical wilderness, but now we're going to talk about how we can look at their physical wilderness and how apply it to the times that we go through in our own wilderness in our lives. And when we look at the wilderness, and I'll show you through the Word of God today, that our life being that chain, when we take times during those wilderness, those low times and those weak links in our life, we begin to give focus to those weak links. And we begin to give attention to those weak issues. And we begin to build them up, to strengthen them up through what God has revealed to us in these times of desert, these times of, of sorrow, these times of, of frustration. And we begin to build up those weak links so that when that chain is stretched, now its capacity is much greater. But before we get into speaking about going into the wilderness and the wilderness times in our life, I need to say this to you, that the wilderness is a seasonal thing. It is not a permanent situation in your life. I love to tell this to the young adults as they come sometimes, especially the younger that they, they, they come, the, the, the more issues or the more dramatic their problems are. And oftentimes it's like the world is over. And I like to tell them as they come to me and their problems and you kind of sit back from the third person and say, wow, not that big of a deal. But I tell to them, you know, listen, the Bible tells us, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. Yea, though I walk through. And in times of our wilderness, church, we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. We don't put our tents there. We don't build our homes there. We don't establish our families and our cities there. We move through it. So I'm here to tell you, as we talk about times of wilderness, they are seasonal times in our life, and they are not to be permanent issues in your life. If you give unto God and you put your focus upon God, as we'll see in just a moment through the examples of those that have ventured into the wilderness, you will see that you can get through these, through the hope, through the joy, through the fact that there is a light at the end of your tunnel, that there is a passage through the valley of the shadow of death, but you don't stay there. So we're going to take some examples looking into the Word of God at those who have ventured into the wilderness. Are you guys ready to dig in to the Word of God this, this afternoon? Praise God. Well, I know I am. So here we go. Today we're going to be talking about stepping into wilderness. And I've got four simple points based on four simple illustrations of those who have ventured, those who have lived, those who have been in the wilderness. We're going to take their examples and look at them today. So looking at today, number one, in stepping into wilderness. Number one, stepping into wilderness removes our pride. So often when life happens, so often when the, when the events, when the issues of life come upon us, you know, we go from good moments to bad moments. And I like to think of the example of perhaps maybe we think that we're standing on our pedestal. You might want to even call it your soap box, whatever it might be. When things are good, you're standing up high on that pedestal. And sometimes life has a way of kicking that pedestal, that soap box out from underneath us to where we fall on our heads. And when we step out into the wilderness, one of the things that goes along with us is our pride. You could even say it like this. One of the things that goes along with us is our old ways, the old man, the old thoughts. You know, I remember one time my, my wife and I, we were having a good argument. 
And it was in the time of my life when we were in, in the wilderness. And I remember we were just going at it, man. I tell you, it was a good argument. It helped our relationship, I'll tell you that. But she looked at me and she just let it out. She says, you know what? You are just an arrogant jerk. And I was like, damn. Right? I mean, I, my wife is never, Stacy is like the most soft-spoken type person. And when she let it fly, I just kind of like, she, we were just talking about it. She said, man, you just kind of like stared into, into nowhere for like 10 minutes, just kind of like. And all of a sudden I realized, you know what? In that wilderness time of, our, of my life when I was going through certain things that were frustrating me, certain things that were bringing me down, certain things that I didn't feel like I could get through it. Here my wife drops this beautiful bombshell on me telling me about how, I, how I've been coming off. And, how, and all of a sudden it was like, you know what? When she told that to me, I began to look at my life, began to look at how I was, and I was like, man, I got no pride left. I was like, I got nothing left, man. Here I am, man, even when my wife tells me it's done, you know, and so the wilderness removes us of our pride, you know, but not just to my own example. My favorite thing to do is to look at examples of the Bible, of people that were placed in the Bible. Why? They weren't just there so that we could read history. They were there so that we could learn from them. And I think one of the best examples that we can look at for those who had to remove their pride was the children of Israel as they exited from Egypt into the promised land. Oftentimes I'll read the, the story, you'll hear the story, you, remember maybe, you might even remember the, the movie with Charlton Heston and the great Ten Commandments, or maybe even that one cartoon about the, the, the exodus from Egypt, whatever it might be. You might know the story and you think about it, man, these guys just did not get it. They just didn't get it. You know, you start to look back and you start to judge on them and say, man, these guys, man, if I was there, I would get it. But then sometimes we look at the issues of our life when we're in our own wilderness and we look back and say, wow, okay, all right, I didn't get it either. But the beautiful thing is, is that they're there for us to learn. So we've got, if you've got your Bibles, why don't we turn to the book of Deuteronomy? We're going to look in the first chapter. And here, I'm going to tell you, as you're turning to the book of Deuteronomy here, Moses is recounting the history when the children of Israel had come to the promised land, they had come to the banks of the Jordan River from the wilderness, and they had been looking upon the land that God had promised to them. And you remember the story, Moses had sent spies, 12 spies, one spy from each of the, of the tribes of Israel to report back on the land. And here in, Moses, in Deuteronomy, the first chapter, we're going to look at verse number 30. The report comes back to Moses. And they come back and they say, from the promised land, it's a beautiful land flowing with milk and honey. Everything we could ever ask, want, or need is there. Truly, this is the promised land. But the problem is, is there are inhabitants of this land. There are giants that look upon us like grasshoppers. Surely we cannot do it. And 10 of the 12 spies report back that it cannot be done. Only two of those, ten, of those 12, Joshua and Caleb, say, come on. Are you kidding me? Is this not the land that God had promised us? And so they push forward. But here God hears them, and so Moses is recounting the report of the spies, and he says to them in verse number 30 of the first chapter of Deuteronomy, he says, The Lord your God who goes before you, he will fight for you according to all he did for you in Egypt before your eyes. Before we even get into anything else, we're talking about going into the wilderness, stepping into the wilderness, how it removes our pride. I want to show you right here in Deuteronomy, the first chapter, I want you to know something. When you step into the wilderness, first right off the bat, the Bible tells us that the Lord your God who goes before you. Church, it's time to understand that when you step into these hard times of your life, when you step into these times of your wilderness, to know this, that the Lord your God will go before you. You are not in this battle alone. You are not in this trial alone. You are not journeying like the children of Israel through the wilderness by yourself. Here we see in Deuteronomy that the Lord your God who goes before you, he will fight for you. And we, say, we see here, as he did for you in Egypt before your eyes. Now you recall the story after the ten plagues. Pharaoh himself had released the, the Hebrews to go and Moses took them and led them to the Red Sea and then Pharaoh changed his mind. He said, nope, this is not a good thing. So Pharaoh assembled his army. At the time, it is irre irrefutable that Egypt is the world power of that time. They have the greatest army, the greatest economy in all the earth. So here, the world power of, of, comes against the Hebrews and they're stuck between a rock and a hard place. Now they're stuck at the Red Sea with seemingly no way to swim across it, no way to get across it. It would take them too long to go around it. Pharaoh's army would surely come against them and if they tried to go back to Egypt now, Pharaoh has sent his army to consume them. You remember the story when Rose's, Moses raises his staff and the Red Sea parts and the children of Israel cross, the Bible says, through on dry ground. Yeah. And then Pharaoh's army proceeds to chase after them through the parting of the Red Sea. Now some people who try to come against the Bible to try to, 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 to disprove the truth of the word say, well, you know, 
The miracle here is that, you know, there's not really that much of a miracle because the Red Sea where they crossed or where they may have crossed was only three feet deep at the time. So they could have actually waded through that and maybe perhaps through tides the sea had gone by. Well, that's fine. That's great. Call it whatever you want. If you want it to be three feet or 30 feet, the bottom line is that the world power, the army, the greatest army in the world followed after them in that three foot deep water, whatever you might want to call it, and was consumed by the water when it came upon them. So whether it's three feet, 300 feet, or 30 feet, it doesn't matter. They saw in Deuteronomy, as he says here, that God had fought for them as, he, as they saw in Egypt. Continuing on in verse number 31 of Deuteronomy, the first chapter. And he says, and in the wilderness, you saw how the Lord God carried you as a man carries his son in all the way that you went until you came into this place. Yet another thing here to, to consider while you venture into your wilderness places. One, we saw that God goes before you in the wilderness places. Secondly, we see here that God does not only go before you in the wilderness places, but he can carry you as a father carries a son through these wilderness places. We'll get into that in a little bit more detail here, but now I recall the story. You know, I have a son. My, my, my beautiful boy Bjorn is nine months old. He's at that point now where he loves to crawl up on and stand up on my leg and reach for me. And as a dad, I reach down and I pick him up and I carry him and I hold him tight. And that's the same thing that God will do to you in your times of trial, in your times of wilderness, in your times of frustration, in your times of darkness. God, like a father who carries his son, will carry you through your times of wilderness. So here we again read in Deuteronomy. He says, now that God has carried you as a father does his son. Yet for all that, you did not believe the Lord your God. Who went the way before you to search out a place for you to pitch your tents. To show you the way that you should go in fire by night and in cloud by day. You might know the story. You may not know the story. As the Hebrews wandered, it took them about two and a half years from the time they left Egypt to the time they got to the banks of the Jordan River for the first time. Some experts say that that, took, that journey should have only taken them two or three days is what, what it might have taken. Let's, let's be conservative and we'll call it two or three weeks. It took them two and a half years. Now in that time of two and a half years, God had revealed himself to them. Out of, after they had crossed the Red Sea, which is already a miracle in itself, now they had crossed the Red Sea, now they get into the wilderness and now they find that there's no water. When they come into a well of water, they find that the water is sour. They cannot drink the water. God makes the water of the well drinkable for them. Then they get into the wilderness and they begin to murmur and they begin to grumble saying that surely God and Moses have brought us out here so that we might starve. Then God brings manna from heaven. God provides everything that they might need. Now God doesn't only just lead them into the wilderness so that they might find the promised land and let them aimlessly wander for two and a half years. The Bible just tells us right here that he led them in a pillar of uh, a cloud of smoke and a pillar of fire. Right there, that's a miraculous event. I'll tell you this, I have never seen a pillar of fire guide me down the 10 freeway. God himself navigated them, directed them, gave them the direction in which they should go. Yet through all of that, when they got to the banks of the Jordan, they could not believe that God was able enough to give them the land which he promised. In verse number 34, it says, And the Lord heard the sound of your words and was angry and took an oath, saying, Surely none of these men of this evil generation shall see the good land which I swore to give to your fathers. Now we see that here's what God says, listen, because of your pride, because your inability to shake the old from the way you were, because you came out of this place as slaves and for two years I taught you that you were the children of God, I showed you that I would care for you, I showed you that I would give you everything you need, yet you come to this place and you doubt me, you believe me, your own pride, your own belief steps above what you have seen physically. God says, because of that, I will remove your pride from you as a nation. And he turns their direction from the Jordan, the banks of the Jordan, back into the wilderness where they wander for 40 years until the generation of those who did not believe God has now passed. And only those, Joshua and Caleb, and the children of the generation who that generation said they would be victims because God led them into the wilderness now will be the inheritance of the land. And if you've got your Bibles, we'll just skip ahead to the next chapter or the next book, Joshua in the first chapter. Now it's 40 years later. Moses has passed. Joshua and the children of Israel, the next generation are again now standing on the very banks of the Jordan River once again, looking into the promised land, talking about how God, how in the wilderness, God will remove our pride. Our pride will be removed. In the, verse, in the sixth chapter of Joshua, God speaking to Joshua says, Listen, be strong and of good courage. For th of good courage, for this, to this your people, you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to your fathers. 
Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn to it from the right to the left that you may prosper wherever you go. Let me tell you something, church. When God repeats himself, we ought to listen. And now here God is speaking to Joshua, the next generation, as they stand on the banks of the Jordan, looking into the promised land, and God says, be strong and of good courage. Again, be strong and courageous. Why? Because the previous generation, because of their pride, because of their lack, their inability to shed themselves of the old, were not strong and courageous. So God says, listen, remember what I have done for you. Remember how I have sustained you. Remember how I have brought you out of a land. Remember how I have provided everything you ever needed. Remember how I gave you the law so that you don't go to the right, that you don't go to the left, but you keep your eyes fixed upon me and you shall be blessed, God tells Joshua. Verse number eight, he says, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate, think upon it, learn it, love it, grow on it, Memorize it, whatever you want to call it, in that day and night that you may observe to do all that is according that is written for, for then, for then, conditional statement. Here he says, for then, you will make your way prosperous. And then, again, speaking of that conditional statement, if you meditate and observe to do what God has asked, then you will have good success. So when we are in the wilderness looking upon the, the children of Israel as an example, we see that they could not shake their pride. Even though God had shown them miraculous things, God had led them as, as a cloud in the day and a pillar of fire by night. God had fed them from heaven. Here we see that God says, listen, remember, be strong and courageous. And, and when your pride is gone because of the wilderness, now all of a sudden you realize, you know what? No longer is it who I, was, was, who I once was. Now I am who God has called me to be. Now I am that generation that can inherit the land that God has promised. We're talking about today, stepping into the wilderness. Number one, stepping into the wilderness removes our pride. Number two, today, stepping into the wilderness opens our eyes. Hello. Yeah. Oftentimes when we go about our lives, especially when things are good, we have a tendency to look upon ourselves, to think about how things are going for us. I love how I use the example of last service. Our, our administrator always calls it navel gazing. Looking upon your own belly button. When you fixed upon yourself, you don't see the world around you. You don't see God around you. You see yourself. And oftentimes when we venture into that wilderness, when we venture into those times of trial, those times of frustration, those times of hurt, those times of grieving, all of a sudden our eyes are open to the world around us, to God himself around us, where he's now able to where once things were good, things were going great, and we didn't want to hear anything from anybody. Now all of a sudden where our eyes are open and our ears are ready to hear, what can I do to get out of this? And I love the story of the great prophet Elijah. If you've got your Bibles, let's turn to the book of 1 Kings. We're going to start in the 19th chapter. I'm going to go ahead and give you from the 17th chapter all the way to the 19th chapter through paraphrase. So as I do that, you can turn to the book of 1 Kings, the 19th chapter. Let me tell you a little bit about the prophet Elijah. Talking about being in the wilderness, how it opens our eyes. Now here we go. In the 17th chapter of the first book of Kings, Elijah shows up on the scene. There is a king at the time. His name is Ahab. He's the king of Israel. And he does not follow after God. Ahab is married to a lady named Jezebel. Jezebel is no good. <laughs> so Elijah comes unto Ahab and he says, listen, Ahab, because of who you are, because of what you've done, God has said to me to tell you that there will be no more rain in the land. There will be no more dew on the ground until God says so. Now there's a drought called upon the land. And right after that in the seventh the second chapter, or the second verse of the 17th chapter, I'll just go ahead and put it up on the overhead. God leads Elijah into the wilderness. But he says, the word of the Lord came to him saying, verse number three comes along and says, get away from here. Turn eastward and hide by the brook Cherith, which flows into the Jordan. Check this out. And when it be that you shall drink from the brook, and I have commanded ravens to feed you there. Now, God has told Elijah, listen, man, you delivered some news. You delivered a knockout punch to Ahab. Now you better get out of here, and I'm going ha to have you go to the, the brook, and I'm going to have ravens feed you. Ravens. We call them crows. Let's just talk. Have you ever seen a crow share? <laughs> have you ever seen a crow come down from his high perch upon that telephone pole and help a weary animal in need? Crows are scavengers. By nature, they take, they steal, they get whatever they can in order to survive. Now here God says, I'm going to take that, which by nature would never give you anything and give it to you. Miracle. 
So now here Elijah is in the wilderness by the brook and the ravens are feeding him. Miracle. Okay. So now the brook dries up. Why? Because the rain and the dew are gone. So now there's no more water in the land and the brook dries up. So God says, Elijah, I would like you to go to the widow. She will take care of you there. She's gathering sticks and she has a son. So Elijah moves on and he goes to the widow. And this wo when he comes upon this widow, she's gathering sticks. And Elijah says to her, wow, I'm pretty famished. I would like for you to make me a tasty morsel to eat. And the widow says to him, I am gathering six sticks that I might cook one more meal. That all we have left is a meal for my son and I that we might eat it and then die. God, now listen here. God didn't send Elijah to the Ritz. God didn't send Elijah to the courtyard at Marriott where they've got the free continental breakfast. God sent Elijah to the widow who had nothing. So Elijah says to this widow who was planning on eating this last tasty morsel that she had and then dying with her son, God, Elijah says to her, if you make it for me, trust in the Lord that you will not have any need during this time of famine. And she does. Miracle. Tell me, if you would go to somebody's house and they were to tell you, listen, I'm going to eat this last thing and then I'm going to die. If you were to say, man, why don't you make it for me? That they're going to say, okay, yeah, sure, right? No, miracle, right off the bat. So now Elijah and the widow and her son have been sustained during this time of drought. Now God says, it's time to go back and tell Ahab. But before Elijah leaves, the widow's son dies. Now the widow says, hey, what's going on? Didn't the God sustain us through this, this famine? So Elijah takes the widow's son and goes up and he gets with God. Brings the widow's son from death back to light. Miracle. See where I'm going with this? So now all of a sudden Elijah goes back to Ahab and says, Ahab, now it's time for the rain to come. But before it does, I want to challenge you and the prophets of Baal to a little game. Let's say a little gesture. How about we do this? How about we make altars? You make an altar to your God, I make an altar to my God. And you see, we see who calls down fire from heaven. And whoever the fire from heaven comes down from, then we know that's the real God. So the 450 prophets of Baal, the idol in which they worship, said, okay, let's do it. So they built their idol. Elijah built, built, built their altar. Elijah built his altar. And you remember the story, the, the prophets of Baal cut themselves. They, 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 they stretched themselves. They pulled themselves. They, they tortured themselves in order that their, their God might come and deliver fire. And all the time, Elijah is mocking them, teasing them. And finally, it is Elijah's turn. So Elijah says, hey, you know what? Why don't we take some water and pour it on my altar? Take some more water, pour it on my altar. Take some more water and pour it on my altar. Now Elijah calls down fire from heaven, and fire comes from heaven and consumes everything. Miracle. Now Elijah says it's time for the, for the drought to end, and he asks his servant, do you see a storm cloud on the horizon? And his servant says to him, nay, I do not. Seven times he asks his servant, and finally on the seventh time, his servant says, yes, I see a cloud coming from the sea that's the size of a man's hand, very small. And the Bible says all of a sudden that cloud grew and the skies grew dark and a great storm rose and Ahab fled. And Elijah girded up his loins and chased after Ahab in a chariot. Ahab was in a chariot. Elijah ran after him and beat him to his destination. He outran a chariot. Miracle. Now the Bible says Jezebel had heard what Elijah had done after he had slaughtered the 450 prophets of Baal after he had defeated them with fire on the altar. Now Jezebel is mad. Remember, she's no good, right? So Jezebel's mad and she says, Elijah, you're dead. Now Elijah, after all of that, after everything he had just experienced from God, everything he had just seen from God, Elijah is fearful and he runs for his life. And he runs into the wilderness. And the Bible tells us that he runs, that he wishes that he might die, that he prays to God that he might sleep and fall, fall asleep and die. And the Bible tells us that Elijah falls asleep and an angel touches him and wakes him up and says, hey, here's some food and water. Eat and drink. Elijah wakes up, eats and drinks, goes back to sleep. An angel touches him. Hey, there's some food and water. Eat and drink. And the Bible says that it sustains him as Elijah ventures to the mountain that God revealed himself to Moses. Now Elijah is on the very mountain that God showed his goodness to Moses. And now Elijah is hiding in a cave. And we pick up the story in the first book of Kings in the 19th chapter. We'll start in the ninth verse. Here we see that Elijah is in the cave on the very mountain that God showed himself to Moses. And in the ninth verse we read that, and it says, And he, speaking of Elijah, went into a cave and spent the night in that place. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? Let me tell you something. When God asks you a question, it's not because he doesn't know the answer. It's because you don't know the answer. So now God is going to open the eyes of his great prophet Elijah, 
who had experienced so many miracles from God, yet ran at the threat of his life. So God asks Elijah, what are you doing here? Elijah proceeds to answer in the 10th verse and says, I have been very zealous for the Lord, God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets. And with the sword, I am alone and left, and they seek to take my life. Verse number 11, he, speaking of God, says, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, listen to this, the Lord passed by. Okay, I'm going to show you that. The Lord passed by. And a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks and the, into pieces before the Lord. Wow, man, God himself passed by and this great and mighty wind breaks the rocks. But wait a minute, the Bible goes on to say, the Lord was not in the wind. And then a great earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. So Elijah has stood at the entrance of this cave on the mountain and seen that the presence of God has passed by. And just the presence, just the ability, just the power of God has brought a great wind that destroys, that crushes rocks, has brought a great earthquake that shakes the mountain, has brought a great fire that burns the side. Yet that was not even God. That was just the fact that he was there. Now all of a sudden we read in verse number 12, And after the earthquake, the Lord was not in the fire, but after the fire, a still, small voice. Verse number 13, we read, So it was when that Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went and stood at the entrance of the cave. All of a sudden, Elijah acknowledges, his eyes are opened, oh my goodness, God himself has come before me, and now he has revealed himself to me, and I cannot look upon him. And he wraps his face in his mantle so that he cannot look upon. And again, that still, small voice says to Elijah, Elijah, what? are you doing here? And Elijah begins to say the same story again and then the Lord reveals himself and reveals his plan. And he says, Elijah, I want you to go back into the wilderness on your way and I want you to anoint this king and I want you to anoint this king and I want you to anoint Elisha as your successor. And he says, those who have corrosion against me, this king will take out. And if this king doesn't take them out, then this king will take them out. And if that king doesn't take them out, then Elisha, your successor, will take them out. And God shows himself, listen, I am God. I am on the throne. Nothing can come before me. Nothing will come after me. And it doesn't matter what the situation in our life shows. Just like Elisha ran for his life, wished that he was dead because Jezebel threatened him. Sometimes in our situations, in our wilderness, in our dark places, we think that there is nothing else that, we, that can be done. We think that there is nothing that can get us out. We think that there is no further that we can fall and that our life is worthless, that this is, this is the way it is, and this just must be what God has for me. But the bottom line is God is showing you that so that you might open your eyes and realize, just like Elijah, what God had done for him in the past, that God will be there. God is there from the beginning, and God will be there past the end. And nothing can come against God. And when you are on God's side like Elijah, then nothing can stand against you. And now all of a sudden, Elijah's eyes were open to God's plan in his life. Just the same for us in our wilderness. When we are in those times of dark, when we are in those times of trouble, our eyes get opened to the things that God has done for us and the things that God will do for us. Why? Because God is God on the throne. Yeah, right. We're talking about stepping into the wilderness. Are you guys with me today? Yes. Number three today in stepping into the wilderness, stepping into the wilderness reveals our dependence upon God. First of all, it removes us of our pride. It opens our eyes to the things around us, to the word of God around us. Now it shows us our dependence upon God looking back Further back in history, back to Moses as he's leading these Hebrews from Egypt into the promised land. Now Moses is, you know, the Bible tells us that Moses was, was, uh, was a man hard of speech. You know, some say he stuttered, so God gave him Aaron. Aaron spoke to Pharaoh for him. Moses' presence was there. Moses had acted as the pastor of that group as he led them from the wilderness into the promised land. Now, you know that Moses had some hard times. We read about that because when, Moses talked to, when God told Moses to speak to the rock that it might produce water, Moses got mad and he hit the rock. When Moses came down from the mountains the first time after bringing the Ten Commandments, he holding them in his hand, that great, story, that great visual illustration of Charlton Heston coming down from the mountain with a big gray beard, holding those two tablets of stone. And then all of a sudden he sees that while he was on the mountain, they created an idol. Moses throws the rocks and breaks them. So now God calls Moses to the hill, to himself. And God says, Moses, come, let's chat. 
So Moses goes upon the hill, the hill that, the mountain that Elijah was just at in Exodus, the 34th chapter. I'll just put it up on the overhead so that you can read it along with me. In Exodus, the 34th chapter, here Moses is in the wilderness. Moses is upon the hill of God, in the presence of God. And it says here in the 34th chapter, verse number 28. So he was there with the Lord for 40 days and for 40 nights. And he neither ate bread nor drank water. And he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant. The Ten Commandments. Here we read that Moses was in the presence of God. The very presence of God in front of Moses sustained him from the basic necessities of life. I like to be outside. I like to go hiking. I like to go camping. I like to be out in the wilderness. It is commonplace for, for those who, who are out in the wilderness, commonplace survival, to know that um, any survival guide you read will generally read something like this. That after three days of no water, you pose a serious risk to life. You might be able to endure 40 days without food, but 40 days without water is nigh impossible. But here, in the presence of God, God sustains Moses from food and water. Yes. Now, let me share this with you. We're talking about Moses in the phys physical wilderness. Moses was in a time before Jesus Christ, before the new covenant that you and I live in. Moses was in a time called the law. Moses brought down the law, the Ten Commandments, down to the children of Israel. Moses set the, the Levitical, Le Levitical line, the priests, into order. While they were in the wilderness, they established all of that. And now you and I come some, some thousands of years later and we see that now that we're under a new situation, we are under a new covenant. We are under the covenant of Jesus Christ. God is our sustaining power. God is everything we need. All of our dependence is upon God. But let me show you what the Word of God says about you and I in the New Testament. In the book of 2 Corinthians, here Paul the Apostle is writing. In 2 Corinthians, the third chapter, verse number 5 and 6, I'll throw them up on the overhead for you. Paul the Apostle is writing, saying, listen, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is on God. Verse number six, who has made us sufficient as ministers of this new covenant. Why not the letter of the law, but the spirit? Why? Because the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. The letter speaking of the old covenant, the law rules and regulations. He says, now all of a sudden, when God, when he wrote the law for Moses, sustained Moses, now all of a sudden, not the law that gives you life, but the Spirit of God himself who came before us, broke the covenant of the law, gave us a new covenant, brought by the blood of Jesus Christ so that we might have life and have it more abundant. Now all of a sudden we see that our sufficiency comes from the Spirit of God that brings life. Life to a desert, life to a wilderness, life to a dark and dying place in our life, in our spirit, in our souls. Now all of a sudden, we can get through that wilderness. Why? Because we realize that it's not on our own power. It's not on our own ability. It's not that we have anything that we can get on our own, but rather our sufficiency, our reliance, our dependence is upon God, who has everything that we ever need. Paul the Apostle in the same book of 2 Corinthians in the first chapter is writing. And in the first chapter, he begins to speak to them about comfort. And then in the eighth verse, the ninth verse, he begins to tell them, he says, listen, I'm not going to put it up on the overhead. I'll just read you the story. I'll just tell you a story. He says to them, he says, listen, I don't want you to be ignorant of what happened to me in the province of Asia. He says in the eighth chapter, he says, we were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure so that we despaired of life itself. Tell me, does that sound like a wilderness area? Tell me, does that sound like a dark place? Does that sound like a desert time in his life? When they were stretched far beyond their ability, so they despaired of life, verse number nine goes on to say, indeed we had felt that we had received the sentence of death. Paul the apostle himself, Paul the great apostle, says, listen, we got to the point where we despaired of our life. We thought it was over. We thought we were done. These were some hard times. And he says, we despaired our own lives. And then he says in the, ninth, in the ninth verse, he says, indeed that we had received the sentence of death, but this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. Paul the Apostle in his own trials and tribulation realizes that, you know what? Through those hard times, through those times of tribulation, through those times where he thought his life was over, then he realized, you know what? Nothing he can do on his own power will get him out of the hole that he's in, only his dependence upon God. And church, it's time for us to realize that when we go through our wilderness times, when we go through those times of darkness and those times of mourning and those times of frustration, that we have got to realize that nothing we can do on our own, nothing we can figure out on our own is going to help us get out of that. But our dependence upon God will pull us out of the muck and the mire into a new and promised land. Are you guys with me today? 
Lastly, today, talking about stepping into the wilderness. Number one is it removes our pride. Number two is that it opens our eyes. Number three is that it reveals our dependence upon God. Number four, I like this one. It's the toughest one probably of them all. But number four is it tests our faith. Like I said earlier, it is easy to say life is good when life is good. It is easy to say that I have faith for something when that something might be coming in. But when there is no light at the end of that tunnel, when you are in the midst of the darkness, when you are in the middle of the desert place, that is when real faith steps in. Because now all of a sudden everything comes against you. The world says you can't do it. God, you know, the, the family, the friends, those around you say, no, nope, you're done. You can't do it. Can't get out of this. Like Job himself, his wife, when he was encouraging, when we saw with Pastor Deb or Pastor Jim, when Job's his wife said unto himself, curse God that you might die. Now all of a sudden real faith shows up. And we read and Pastor Jim showed us the example of Jesus Christ right after he was baptized. You, you recall the story? Jesus Christ comes and where John the Baptist is baptizing people and Jesus asks John to baptize him. John says, no, Lord, is that you should baptize me. And Jesus said, no, let the word be filled that you baptize me. So Jesus Christ is baptized by John the Baptist. Wow, that's a lot of baptism. Now all of a sudden Jesus rises after being baptized and the, the heavens open up. You know the story. And the light shines down upon Jesus Christ and the Spirit of God descends upon him in the form of a dove. And you hear the voice crying from heaven, Behold, this is my Son in whom I am well pleased. Amen. Wow. The light has shone upon his shoulders. God himself is, has descended upon Jesus Christ. That sounds like a good time, doesn't it? Immediately after the baptism in Matthew, the fourth chapter, verse number one, we read that the Spirit leads Jesus Christ into the wilderness. Why? So that he might be tempted of the devil. Right after that high time, right after the Spirit is fulfilled, the, 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 the prophecy is fulfilled, now all of a sudden Jesus, and in this time of great pleasure, of this time of celebrating, maybe they should have gone out and had dinner to celebrate his baptism, now all of a sudden the Spirit of God comes upon him and leads him into the wilderness. Now we read that God himself last week and the week before, that God himself will not tempt you. We read that in James, the first chapter. But the Spirit himself led Jesus Christ that he might be tempted, so that he might be tested. So that he might prove himself to be the son of God. So that when attributes, when, when, or when, when, when things come against him, when, when adversities come against him, now all of a sudden Jesus can say, I have endured the wilderness. The book of Mark tells us that Jesus Christ, after being baptized, was driven into the wilderness by the Spirit. So God leads him into the wilderness. Why? So that his faith might be tested. So that his faith might become strong. So that he might face the enemies, the, the, the weapons of the enemy, and he might come against them. He might speak the word of God to Satan. Church, it's time for us when we get into that wilderness, when we go into those dark places to understand that it is our faith that is being tested. Yes. If, if Satan is stupid enough to think that Jesus Christ himself would fall to temptation, how much little more does he think of you and I? But the bottom line is we can follow the example. Remember we talked about in Deuteronomy how God himself came and laid the way before us. Remember we saw in Deuteronomy how God carries us like a father to his son. Now we can see that that son has laid the way before us and has showed us how to resist the temptations of the enemy, how to resist the, 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 wild, the wily, uh, um, what is it, the term I'm looking for, the, the fiery darts of the enemy, the cunningness of Satan himself. Now we can be tested in our own faith. Amen. I think of Hebrews 11th chapter. We call this the hall of faith. Yes. You don't do nothing to get into Hebrews 11th chapter. You do something. Here we read about Abraham in Hebrews 11th chapter. In the hall of faith, Hebrews 11th chapter, number 17. I'll just put it up on the overhead. It says, by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. Here, Abraham. The Bible goes on to say that Abraham was willing to give Isaac as a sacrifice when God asked him, knowing that God could full well bring Isaac back from the dead because he promised him. So Abraham had faith. But let me tell you something. Don't you think that Abraham was in a time of desert place, of wilderness, when God came upon him and said, Abraham, I got a favor to ask of you. I would like for you to give me your only son that I had promised to you on the altar. I myself have a nine-month-old boy, Bjorn, and I can only imagine if God said to me, Luke, in order for you to prove your, your truth, faithfulness to me, I would like you to offer up your son to me. Thank God we live in a new covenant where that would never happen. But 
I could only imagine that I would be torn in my emotions, that I would be conflicted in my thoughts and my faith towards God. And yet here Abraham rises early in the morning and he takes his son Isaac up to the, up to the wilderness and he builds an altar there and he lays Isaac upon that altar and he raises his hand into the air with a knife ready to give his son as a sacrifice to God when God says, wait, Abraham, now I know. And he proceeds to tell Abraham the truth that your descendants will be like the stars in the sky and the sands in the sea and you will be a father to many nations. And he begins to, begins to give Abraham the promise of his inheritance that God had promised to him because of his faith was tested in that time of wilderness. Church, when we go out into those wilderness places, whether we've been there before, whether we're in one now or whether we get to one later in our life, understand that our faith will be tested. But that's okay. In, in the book of 1 Peter, the first chapter, verse number 6, verse number 7, Peter writes, In this, greatly rejoice, sometimes easier said than done, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, the reality of your faith, who you really are, the inner man, all that other stuff stripped away, the person to the right, to the left, left behind, now it is just you and God, the genuineness of your faith, be much more precious than gold that perishes, perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Our faith would be tested, but it's a good thing. Why? Because in that same verse, verse number six, going back to it, says that rejoice. Why? Now for a little while. There is light, church, at the end of the tunnel through those wilderness times that we can rest assured that these wilderness times, these times of darkness, these times of frustration, these times of loneliness, whatever they might be, are only seasonal. And that there is a light at the end of the tunnel that now we can rest assured. Why? Because for a little while, if need be, we have been tested. If need be being, we have those weak links in our life. And now we address those weak links. Amen. I love what Hebrew says in the 12th chapter. It says, looking unto Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising shame. Why? That he might sit at the right hand of the Father. Church, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. There is hope when you are in the middle of that wilderness area to look upon Jesus Christ, the Spirit who gives life, and to say, you know what? Who for the joy set before him endured his wilderness time of the cross and crucifixion. Why? That he might despise the shame and sit at the right hand of the Father. We can rejoice. Why? For the joy set before us that we are children, heirs and co-heirs with God. And that this wilderness time, like Peter says, is only for a little while that we might need it so that we could be tested, the genuineness of our faith. And in final, in closing, I got one more verse. Can you handle one more verse? In James, the first chapter, second verse, number third verse. This is a verse that's pretty familiar to us. You know, for me, personally, I have been going through a time of wilderness, a time where things were great. When I was ordained and I came up here and I received that, that ordination certificate, it was like the Spirit of God in, in the light, like Jesus when he was baptized, the Spirit of God came upon me and it was like, oh, right, things were great. Took over the young adults with my friend, Pastor Joe. You know, the video department was churning out videos and, our, and we were doing great. I mean, everything was just wonderful. And then all of a sudden, things in my own life began to dry up. Things in my spiritual life began to dry up. And all of a sudden, I wasn't hearing the revelation of God like I once had heard. And I began to enter into this wilderness time. And I began to think, oh, this is miserable. What am I doing wrong? I began to look at myself, look at those weak links in my chain. And just last week, as a matter of fact, somebody came to me and says, I have a word that I felt like God had told me to tell you. And I said, okay, what is it? And I said, you know, he said to me, he says, you know, I sense that God is telling me that you've been going through a rough patch. You've been going through a wilderness time. And he says, I want you to remember to be at joy when you go through those times. Why? Because in James, the first chapter, the second verse and the third verse says to us, my brethren, count it at all joy when you fall into various trials. Why? Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Church, there is a light at the end of the tunnel through our wilderness. We walk through that valley. We don't stay there because now we know that when we get out of that wilderness, the weak link in our chain is now stronger. And now when the, tr then the trials of life, when the pressures of life pull against us, when we get to a capacity that that chain once could only bear, now the chain of our life can hold more capacity. And now God can do much more than we ever thought or imagined that he could have done in our life. Why? Because that weak link that once would have broken under pressure, now through the wilderness, through the dark times, is stronger. That why the testing of our faith 
produces patience. Amen. So looking at stepping into the wilderness, stepping into the wilderness, one opens our eyes so that we might fix them upon God. I'm sorry, stepping into wilderness, number one, removes our pride so that we might forget ourselves. Stepping into wilderness, number two, opens our eyes so that we might look upon God and see all that he has done and all that he is capable of doing. Stepping into the wilderness, number three, reveals our dependence upon God, knowing that, you know what, we can't do this on our own. There's nothing that we can do on our own. We can't do it. But God can. Our dependence upon God. And finally, stepping into the wilderness tests our faith. Did you guys get something out of that today? Well, praise God, praise God. Hey, listen, I want to do one more thing. I want to ask everybody, please remain seated. No getting up. Don't walk around. Honor the Lord and the presence of God as he comes into this place. But before we do that, I want to, I want to remind you really quickly, first off, that there is water baptism right after service today. If you have not yet been water baptized, I encourage you to go out there and get water baptized. We just read that Jesus Christ was baptized himself, and you ought to be baptized as well. You know, you say, Pastor Luke, it's a tad bit on the chilly side. Perhaps I'll go during the summer. Let me tell you this. You know, we were hearing a story of the, of the, the underground church in Russia during the, the days of the, the Cold War when they would break the ice of the northernmost lakes and rivers in Russia to break the ice and get into the water to get baptized so that the KGB would never follow them and not find them. Well, we got that water heated for you. So I tell you what, even if it is chilly, you can get out there. You say, Pastor Luke, I don't have a bathing suit. I don't have, you know, get out there and what you got. Get out and get baptized. And I encourage you, you don't want to miss out on that. So make advantage, make advantage of that. Take advantage of that. And also don't miss tonight, Pastor Mark Horn from Bondi Beach, Australia. I tell you what, you're not going to want to miss that. Listen, before we do anything else, I want to ask you a question. I want you to answer this question within your heart. You know, the Bible says that a man ought to examine himself from time to time. So let me ask you a question. And why don't we go over the answers with you in your heart? You, I want to ask you this. If you were to leave this place today and you were to die, heaven forbid, I hope that's not the case. I pray that's not the case. But if you were to leave this place today and you were to die, would you find yourself in heaven or would you find yourself in hell? It's a pretty simple question. But why don't we go over maybe some of those answers that you've had? You know, you might say, well, Pastor Luke, you know, if I was to die, I think I'd get to heaven. I hope I'd get to heaven. Can you show me in the Bible where it says that because you think that you're going to get into heaven, that you're going to find yourself there if you were to die? Can you show me where it says that because you have the most positive outlook on life, because you think you can, you think you can, you think you can, that you're going to get into heaven? No, where will you find that? Can you show me in the Bible, in the Word of God, where it says that you hope that you're going to get in heaven, you're going to get there, that you, that you genuinely have a desire to find yourself in heaven, and because of that, you'll find yourself in heaven. Can you show me where it says that? Nowhere in the Bible will you find that because you think you're going to get to heaven, that you're going to find yourself there, because you hope, because you want to, because you desire to get to heaven, that you're going to find yourself in heaven. Nowhere will you see that. You know, you might say, well, Pastor Luke, I don't believe that hell exists. I don't believe that heaven exists. Let me say this to you. Just because you believe that heaven or hell does not exist doesn't mean they're not real. Jesus Christ, God himself came down to speak about our lives, to, to, to reference Satan and hell. If God himself references it, don't you know it's true? Let me even say it like this. You know, I could say, I could have maybe grown up in a place where I had never seen semi-trucks. And I can say to my life, say in my heart, believe in my mind, you know what, I don't believe that semi-trucks exist. And lo and behold, I can go stand in the slow lane of the freeway right here and meet one face to face. Just because you may have never seen it, you may have never experienced it in your own life, therefore you don't believe it doesn't mean it's not real. Heaven is a very real place. Hell is a very real place. And it's time for somebody to love you enough, to honor you enough, to respect you enough, to tell you the truth. Let's quit playing games. You know, you might say, well, Pastor Luke, you know, I wasn't raised as a, as a Buddhist, a Hindu, or a Muslim, or any other type of world religion or philosophical thought. So doesn't that mean that I'm going to get into heaven? Can you show me in the Word of God where it says that because you weren't raised as a Buddhist, a Hindu, or a Muslim, a philosophical thought, or any other type of world religion, that you're going to get your way into heaven by classification? Nowhere will you find that. Well, Pastor Luke, you know, I live in America. America, in our money, says in God we trust. You know, some say it's a Christian nation. Doesn't that mean that I'm going to get into heaven? Can you show me the Bible where it says it because you live in America? That because your money says in God we trust, that you're going to find your way to heaven. No, where will you find it? You know, well, Pastor Luke, I, 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 I'm a good person. I don't cheat on my taxes. I've never robbed the 7-Eleven. I don't drive over the speed limit. I help to fight world hunger. 
doesn't that mean that I'm going to get into heaven? Can you show me the Bible where it says that? Because you don't cheat on your taxes? Because you've never robbed a 7-Eleven? Because you, you drive the speed limit on the freeway? Because you even give to charitable organizations? Or you even try to help fight world hunger? That you're going to find your way into heaven? Can you show me where it says that? And as a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that our good deeds, according to God's righteousness, are like filthy rags. And nothing we ever can do on our own will ever get us into heaven. You might even say, well, Pastor Luke, you know, as a child, my parents said that we were Christians. I attended church on Christmas and on Easter. I even went to Sunday school, Sabbath school, or catechism classes. I was baptized or christened as a baby. Doesn't that mean that I'm going to get into heaven? Can you show me where it says it? Because your parents told you that you were a Christian. Because you went to church on Christmas and on Easter. Because, you know, you, you learned some stories of, of Jesus and the disciples of Moses through baptism or through, through catechism, through Sunday school, through Sabbath school classes that you're going to find your way to heaven. Can you show me where it says that in the Word of God? Nowhere, nowhere will you find that. Well, Pastor Luke, you know, by, by default, I, I call myself a Christian. So doesn't that mean that I'm going to get into heaven? I profess to be a Christian. Can you show me where it says it? Because you give yourself a title that you're going to get into heaven. That's like me sitting in my garage saying that I am a car. At no point will I ever become a car because I gave myself that title. Just because you say that you're a Christian does not mean that you're going to get your way into heaven. You say, well, Pastor Luke, you know, I was, a, I was an usher in my church. I sang in the choir. I carried the pastor's Bible. People could ask me questions about the Bible and I might even be able to answer them. Doesn't that mean that I'm going to get into heaven? Doesn't that count for something? Can you show me the Bible where it says it because you attend church, because you sit in a chair, because you're an usher, because you sang in the choir, because you carried the pastor's Bible, because you could answer questions about the Bible that you're going to get your way in heaven. Can you show me where it says that? Let me show you something. Jesus is, 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 uh, is, is, is standing there and a man by the name of Nicodemus comes up to Jesus in the nighttime and says, Jesus, what must I do to get into heaven? Let me tell you a little bit about Nicodemus. Nicodemus had it going on. Nicodemus had dedicated his young life to studying, to memorizing the scriptures. Nicodemus preached from the pulpits in his church. Nicodemus gave to the poor. Nicodemus said all the right things. He wore all the right clothes. And you would think that when Jesus was speaking to Nicodemus, that Jesus would look at Nicodemus and say, Nicodemus, you know what? You just keep on going. Pat on the back. Great is your reward in heaven. But Jesus looks to Nicodemus and he says, you know what, Nicodemus? You must be born again. Now, what does born again mean? When you hear that term, Hollywood, popular culture, society has made such a mockery out of that term that you think of weirdo, radical, fanatical, crazy, out of, co out of control Christianity. But you know what? From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it has always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart and you've given God all of your life. Look at me, look at me, look at me. God is not after your mental ascent towards Him. He is after all of your heart. He is after all of your life. Jesus speaking to the church in the book of Revelation says to them, listen, when I come back, I better find you hot or I better find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I will spit you out of my mouth. What Jesus is saying to the church, people like you and I in the chairs and listening to the word, what he's saying to them is, listen, I know your deeds. When I come back, when it comes time for you to meet your maker face to face, I better find you in or I better find you out because if you're lukewarm, I will spit you out. I will reject you out of the kingdom of God. Well, what does lukewarm mean? Let me tell you what it means. Lukewarm is this. You're a little bit up, you're a little bit down, you're a little bit in, and you're a little bit out. You know, maybe occasional church attendance, maybe a token prayer here and again. Maybe you even got a cross or St. Christopher around your neck just to say something. You know what the bottom line is? It is this, that you've got too much of the world in you to enjoy God, and you've got too much of God in you to enjoy the world. You're what, we're, you're what we call riding the fence. And Jesus Christ says, if that is you, you are deceived in thinking that you will get into the kingdom of God. And when it comes time to meet him face to face, you will be spit out of the kingdom of God. Today, in just a moment, I'm going to give you the opportunity to say, Pastor Luke, I appreciate the effort that you're going through. You find God your way. I'll find God my way. We'll get there all the same. Love wins. You know what the bottom line is? Let's not do it your way. Let's not do it my way. Today, let's do it God's way. Jesus Christ says that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man, no man goes to the Father except through him. So in a moment, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to count to three. I'm going to go one, two, three. I'm going to go bang. I'm going to smack my hand on that Bible. If that's you in this place, you've never given Jesus Christ all of your heart, all of your life. If you're not sure, or if you've been living lukewarm, if that's you in this place, I want you to pop your hand up. What you're doing by popping your hand up is saying, you know what, I want to go forward with God. You say, Pastor Luke, if I put my hand up, somebody's going to see me and I might be embarrassed. You know what, I'm not going to embarrass you. 
And you know, if even if somebody saw you and you were embarrassed, wouldn't it be better to spend a moment of embarrassment than an eternity in hell? The decision is yours. Jesus Christ said, if you confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father. But if you deny me before men, I will deny you before my Father. The Spirit of God is a gentleman. He will not connive. He will not manipulate. He will not force himself into your life. You have got to want it. You have got to ask it. You have got to receive it. The decision is yours all across this auditorium, all at the same time. In just a moment, I'm going to clap. If that's you, if you've never given all of your heart, all of your life to Jesus Christ, today, let's make it the day you go forward for God. If you're not sure, don't leave this place without making sure. The Bible tells us that tomorrow is not promised of us. If you've been living lukewarm, doing your own thing instead of God, saying running from God instead of to God today, why don't we make it the day today that you go forward for God and get your place in the kingdom of heaven? All across this auditorium, all at the same time. One, two, three. If that's you in this place, go ahead and pop your hand up. Let me see it tonight. Got you. Praise God. One. You can put your hand down, sister. I saw you. Two. Is that? Yeah, I got you, brother. Two. Where are you at? I see you pointing over here, ushers. Where are we at? I see you. Three. I got you. Three people in this place. I didn't embarrass them. I won't embarrass you. Four. I got you, sister. Four people. If that's you in this place, go ahead and pop your hand up so I can see it. Let's move forward for God. Shed ourselves of our pride and open up our eyes and reveal our dependence upon God. If that's you in this place, I got you, brother. I see you. Five. If that's you in this place today, say, man, I wish this guy shut up. I want to get out of here. Maybe I'm talking to you. Go ahead and just pop your hand up. Let's see it today. Let's move forward for God in this place today. If that's you, just go ahead and pop your hand up. Let me see it. I see you. Where are you pointing? I got you. Okay, two of you back there, yeah? Or just one? Okay, got you. Anybody else in this place today? That's you. Just go ahead and pop your hand up today. Well, praise God for six, seven people. Praise God. (laughs) Hallelujah. Here's what I want to do. You raised your hand. You said, you know, I want to give Jesus Christ all my lo- heart, heart all my life. You know what the bottom line is? You don't get saved by raising your hand. You get saved by accepting him into your heart. So here's what you do. You said you want to give him all your heart, all your life. Let us help you today. I want you in a moment, I'm going to ask everybody to get up. If you raised your hand or you should have raised your hand, it is not too late. I want you to grab your coat, your sweater, your purse, your Bible, a friend if you need a friend, and come and meet me right up here at the altar so that you can get Jesus Christ into your heart, in your life. So why don't we stand all at this time? And if that's you, if you raise your hand, get out of your seat and come meet me right here. If that's you, if you didn't raise your hand, you can come too. Come on. You can come. Come on. I live for you alone Cause every breath that I take They're coming, they're coming, come on You can come I'm away. Come on, out of your seats and you can come Lord, have your way in me Lord, I'll give you my heart They're still coming, they're still coming you can come. And I live for you alone. Is every breath that I take, every moment I'm away. They're still coming. They're still coming. Lord, have your way in me. Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. Well, here's what I want to do. I want to introduce to you a friend of mine. You guys can keep coming. You guys can come. Here's what I do. I want to introduce to you a friend of mine. This is right over here. It's Pastor Dave Simmons. Maybe you thought, Pastor, look, are you pretty cool? Nope, this is where it's at right here. (laughs) Pastor Dave is going to take you just right over there. Nothing weird goes on. What he's going to do is he's going to take you right over there. He's going to pray. You don't get saved by raising your hand. You get saved by asking Jesus Christ to come into your heart and to come into your life. So he's going to take you right over there. He's going to lead you in a prayer. He's going to give you some free stuff. Free stuff! He's going to give you a book that our pastor wrote. It's called Welcome to Your Destiny. Hey, you know what? You just got saved. Really easy reading. It says, hey, now this is where you go from here. He's going to also introduce to you a program we have here at the church called Spiritual Personal Trainers. You know when you go to the gym and you see those personal trainers and they help you build those muscles and eat right so that you get strong. 
We're going to introduce to you a program here we have called Spiritual Personal Trainers, a friend, somebody that will meet with you before services that will help build you up, build those spiritual muscles so that you don't go back into the ways that you once were, that you would be strong in the things of God. So if you would just turn to your left, my right, right over here. Praise God.